rush to Mars is on. We are by nature explorers, and so of course we'll go to Mars. From the chief scientist at NASA. We believe we'll have humans in the vicinity of Mars, hopefully in the early 2030s. To the thousands who have signed up for a one-way trip. I couldn't imagine a bigger adventure. Billionaires are building private rockets and space stations. Independent stations, lots of customers, lots of transportation going back and forth. From Earth's darkest depths and haunting landscapes, scientists are looking for clues to Mars. What a lot of people are searching for, the, the Grand Slam home run, would be to discover evidence of life. If we can learn how to explore and to live on Mars, then there's no limit in space. Go, go, go. People in future ages will look back at this particular time as the greatest moment in human history. The passions are powerful and motivations many when the destination is Mars. recorded history, that red light wandering the night sky has fueled human imagination. The Romans named it after their god of war. Others thought it was a distant civilization. When the first telescopes were invented, it made Mars really interesting. When Galileo was looking through the telescopes and he could see the patterns on the surface and then Percival Lowell in the States started using the best of the telescopes to look at Mars and wrote books about the fact that Mars was a dying civilization and convinced himself that he could see canals on Mars. And it fed the science fiction of the era. Today, we are no longer satisfied with Martian fantasies. We want to go there. It was an engineering milestone, landing the one-ton Curiosity rover in the middle of a crater on Mars and the images it transmitted became landmarks in the world's imaginations. Curiosity encountered some interesting rocks. It deployed its drill, and its instruments analyzed the sample. What Curiosity discovered made headlines around the world. You know, back around three and a half, four billion years ago, Mars wouldn't have looked that different from the early Earth. Large parts of the surface covered in water. Volcanoes on the land. Mars's atmosphere would have been denser uh, than it is today. Same conditions to the early Earth, so we believe it's very likely that life would have evolved on Mars. Now, at some point, Mars lost its protective magnetic field. The solar wind, the stream of particles coming from the sun, started stripping Mars's atmosphere away. At that point, water was no longer stable on the surface. Mars became colder and colder. That water retreated underground, uh, largely as ice. Now, did life go extinct, or did life retreat underground? We don't know. We'd like to go find out. This is, at the moment, the world's oldest water. It's between one to one and a half billion years old. We also know that there are components of this water that are even older yet. Some may even be as old as the rocks themselves, 2.7 billion years old. And in fact, one of the most exciting things we're investigating now is that there is life in this water. These microscopic fluorescent stains are evidence that microbes are alive in this ancient water. She's testing to see what kind they might be. Perhaps they're like these microbes she found in South Africa. Whatever the microbe's age may be in the Canadian sample, it proves something can thrive in this salty, primordial, billion-year soup. Deep, salty waters likely also occur deep within the Martian planet, and it provides a perfect target for us to begin to understand whether or not life might ever have arose on Mars, or in fact, might be there still. And 
Nations around the world are lining up to reach it. India has successfully launched its first Mars probe. The European Space Agency just sent this rocket. And soon after, the first private Mars rocket will be launched by SpaceX. By 2020, it's going to get crowded on Mars. These are the models of China's Mars probe, which are... China is sending an orbiter and lander. In Paris, at the headquarters of the European Space Agency, they are committed to landing and drilling. Mars is something like a magnet for illusions, for visions, as well as the moon was in the past. Mars has also become a destination for national prestige. This will be the first ever Arab Islamic mission to another planet. The Emirates Mars mission will have a major impact and a legacy here in the UAE. But no country is more advanced and determined than the United States. The first phase of the journey to Mars is what we call the Earth Reliant phase, and that really centers around the International Space Station. Give me a minute, I'll work on that. Every day, uh, the astronauts from all around the world up on the space station are doing work to get us ready to send humans to Mars. Things like, how does the human body adapt to space? Today, NASA is already preparing a new generation of astronauts for the challenges of deep space exploration. This is the giant training pool at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. One of the coolest things about this job is that we're doing something different every day. And one day we're flying an airplane. The next day we're in the spacesuit doing a training run in the neutral buoyancy lab. We think about the long journey to Mars, the fact that it'll take about six to nine months with today's technology. There are some main areas that we need to be prepared for. And I think one of the principal ones is that of radiation, understanding how to protect humans from the radiation dose that they would receive in getting to Mars. NASA engineers are already building Orion, the space capsule that will get them there. We need to make sure that humans can be protected as much as possible from space radiation, those streams of particles coming from the sun. Now, it turns out those particles, while they're moving extremely rapidly, they're still moving slowly enough that we can fairly effectively shield against them, especially with extra layers of, of metal. And it turns out water is a potentially effective shielding material. So we sort of know how to protect the astronauts but we've also been looking at what's the duration astronauts would spend in deep space, what's the likely dose they would get, and how much of a risk is that? Lisa Spence is in charge of studying how four astronauts can live in this module without killing each other. Giving them space is vital. The first floor is the work area, and then the elevator to the second floor takes you to the living area. Up above are four sleeping modules. It's tight, but there are condos in New York that are smaller. On Mars, the astronauts will need a way to get around the planet's surface. And that's the Space Exploration Vehicle. The Space Exploration Vehicle has two suits, and you access them from the back of the vehicle. You open this up, and then you climb into the suit by doing a chin-up from the, from the chin-up bar, and you put your feet in first. And then when you close your life support system and the door to the cabin, you do pressure checks to know that it's OK to leave the, leave the vehicle. The primary reason for these external suits is to keep the Mars dirt out. A spacesuit in general is already a complex problem because a spacesuit 
you can think of it as a personal spacecraft for one. It has to do everything to keep a person alive and able to work in a very extreme environment for long periods of time. Mars specifically also poses some unique problems. We have to think about how our materials are going to hold up to the radiation environment on Mars for long periods of time. We're used to, with the astronauts and the International Space Station, being close and being able to talk to mission control whenever they have an issue. But for Mars, with the time delay in communications, the astronauts have to be able to do things themselves and they have to be self-sufficient when they're using the suit. So there's a lot of focus on making sure that they can use the space suits without a lot of assistance or a lot of help from flight controllers on the ground. This is the high security laboratory in California where they're designing the most remarkable Mars project of all. The big problem we have going to Mars with humans that requires oxygen is burning the fuel to take the crew home. It's something we don't tend to think about on Earth. When we burn a gallon of gas in our car, we burn tremendous amounts of oxygen as well, but we get that for free. In space, on Mars, we have to bring it with us. At the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, Michael Hecht is designing a way to turn Mars' toxic atmosphere into oxygen, mechanically. That machine is MOXIE. That's what we're building and sending to Mars in 2020 as a demonstrator to show that we have the means in a compact package to fly a little tree to Mars in a compact package that'll breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen. What you see behind me is a laboratory version of what we hope to send to Mars. All we have to do is take all that stuff back there and put it in a box this big, and then we're ready to go. 